Good evening, everyone. My name is David A. Armstrong, and I am 10th president of St. Thomas University. I'm very humbled and honored to be here with you this evening for a very special live webinar, A Victim-Centered Approach to Healthcare for Survivors of Human Trafficking. As some of you know, January is National Slavery and Human Trafficking Prevention Month. For almost two decades, St. Thomas University and the John J. Brunetti Human Trafficking Academy have been the pioneer academic institution in South Florida, and they've been addressing the problematic issue of human trafficking in a focused and interdisciplinary approach and finding solutions to this societal problem of immense magnitude. A problem of this magnitude may only be addressed through integrated efforts and effective partnerships. This event today is a testimony to the importance of partnerships and global networking. At this time, St. Thomas and the Brunetti Academy are bringing to the fore the necessity of training of medical professionals, doctors and nurses, but also other professionals that work in the trenches of anti-trafficking work. We thank you all for being here today. My understanding is we have over 335 registered for this event. We have people tuning in from over 15 countries, six continents, including Africa, Asia, Australia, Europe, North America, and South America. And those attending span every private and public sector, to name a few, doctors and nurses and others from healthcare institutions around the world, survivors of human trafficking, leaders and advocates for task forces, NGOs, and faith-based institutions working against human trafficking. We want to welcome those from governmental entities such as the Department of Defense, Department of Children and Families, Department of Veteran Affairs, and the Department of Homeland Security. And God bless all those who keep us safe. I wanna welcome any other higher education institution. I wanna give a special thanks to our partners, the University of Miami Health Systems Thrive Clinic, the University of Miami Division of CME and Audio Digest Foundation for support in the CME and CEU accreditation, the Rotary Public Health Fellowship and Rotary District 6990. And a special thanks to our distinguished panel of doctors who volunteered their time. The bottom line is this, the world will be a better place because of your dedication. So I wanna welcome everyone. Thank you all for participating and God bless you all. And as we say here, go Bobcats. Thank you so very much, uh, President Armstrong. It's an uh, absolute uh, pleasure to have you with us today and to appreciate the efforts of the John J. Brunetti Human Trafficking Academy. And I also want to thank you for your uh, leadership and uh, driving the mission of St. Thomas University to um, higher, to advancing it higher and to making you also making our local uh, community a better place with your ethical leadership and the contribution that you make in our community through educating our students, but also in a broader context. So thank you very much for supporting our efforts. Always a pleasure to have you, uh, President Armstrong. And uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And um, it is my absolute delight to be here with you today with such a distinguished panel. I am Professor Rosa Patti. I am a professor of law here at St. Thomas University College of Law. And I am also founder and director of the Human Trafficking Academy, now John J. Brunetti Human Trafficking Academy. At St. Thomas Law School, I am also directing, co-directing two programs, two degree programs, the Master of Laws in Intercultural Human Rights, and also the Doctorate of the Science of Law in Intercultural Human Rights. So it is no wonder that in the Catholic tradition of higher education, we focus entirely on issues that spin around human dignity, human dignity, human beings in the image and likeness of God 
are always the centerpiece of our institution. And anything that runs a front to human dignity is what we will be combating. And we thank you for joining us today in these efforts. Well, at St. Thomas Law School, we started work against human trafficking indeed very early on, in the very early 2000s. And I am absolutely delighted to have with us today some of the pioneers of South Florida as well, such as Dr. Heidi Schaffer, who has been with us from the start and uh, we wanna welcome her back. I'll come back to her again. I also wanna thank specifically Dr. Symes, who has also been part of our Human Trafficking Academy before. Welcome back, Dr. Symes. And of course, it's an absolute pleasure and honor to have joining us for the first time, uh, Professor Mezik and also Professor Karalis and Dr. Al-Haji. It's a delight to have you with us today. And I am sure that the 335 participants in this webinar are up for, a, in, for an intellectual treat. As we indeed are dealing today, as we have done for almost two decades with this egregious problem, egregious social problem, a crime, um, an organized crime, a crime against humanity that is plaguing millions of people worldwide, including in our great republic and including in the great state of Florida and in our beautiful uh, South Florida and Miami. So we want to address this phenomenon. We never stop addressing it, but at the same time, we want to find out what are the best ways for us to do it. So. Indeed, we have quite a lot of momentous, but despite that momentous, whether it is moral, legal, and uh, practical achievements that we have had over all these years, still mod uh, modern day slavery, human trafficking remains a reality for millions of people worldwide, including in our great country. Now, every time we say human trafficking as modern day slavery, we also sometimes get some pushback. Is it really a modern day slavery? Now, indeed, we are better off today than at the time when law was a tool to enforce slavery. But from a point of view of fact and common decency, modern slavery, its functional equivalent, human trafficking exists today as well. And it is that situation where a human being is held under absolute control. Over a human being, any or all of those features that are attached to a right of ownership are exercised. And this is the situation that we find ourselves today. So it is that act of absolute importance for us to think about all of these people and to look inwardly to ourselves, where do we stand today and what is it that we can do? Now, of course, uh, as President Armstrong mentioned, it is of extreme importance to work in partnership. Now, we started here in our law school and of course, human trafficking is criminalized conduct, but I always tell my students and also everywhere, Combating human trafficking is not a monopoly of lawyers. And also combating human trafficking only as a crime is not enough. So we need more. And this intersection today of human trafficking and health is of paramount importance. Not only to identify victims of human trafficking and not only to treat and to comprehensively offer healthcare and make whole again the survivors. But also from our perspective within a law school, we also want to seek justice through this interaction of healthcare professionals with lawyers, legal professionals and the law enforcement. Case law throughout the, our country has constantly shown how important it is 
to have this cooperation of healthcare professionals with law enforcement and the legal professionals. Because it's you that has been instrumental, again, not only in identifying and treating, but also in helping bring justice, whether through collecting evidence by first identifying victims, collecting the right evidence, providing your expertise and expert opinions for successful prosecutions, helping out these survivors, these victims of human trafficking to actually become whole again and wanting to serve also as witnesses and face the perpetrators in the face. We are very grateful to our healthcare professionals, nurses and doctors. And for this purpose, we have brought together an esteemed group of professionals of our South Florida. Indeed, it just cannot any cannot get any better than that. So I'm extremely grateful to have these professionals here today. And think about it, that the study that was made by the Annals of Health Law noted that about 88% of survivors, victims of human trafficking that were interviewed said that at some point, while they were still being trafficked, they were in contact with some healthcare professional. So to all our registrants, we can't stress enough the importance of having you work together and be able, get trained and be able to identify victims of human trafficking. And uh, I know that we are pressed for time and you don't want to listen so much from me as from our esteemed panel. So uh, let me uh, bring uh, to run the rest of the show actually the whole show, Dr. Heidi Schaeffer. Um, it's really an absolute honor to have Dr. Heidi Schaeffer uh, with us uh, today. And as I mentioned earlier, we have had her before. Actually, you've been pretty much in, in constant contact. I always look for that pioneer in health, in healthcare in our country. The one that also helped pass those laws, one of which is the reason you all, over 300, are registered in today. Many of you are also mandated to be trained on the issues that we'll be dealing with today. So kudos to Dr. Sheffer and to the esteemed panelists that we have here. As you have seen, and the President Armstrong already mentioned, we are thankful to our um, co-sponsors. Uh, Thrive Clinic, oh, the University of uh, Miami Health System Thrive Clinic, University of Miami Division of CME and Audio Digest Foundation, I had to read it so I can get it absolutely correct, for support in the CMEs and the CEUs accreditation. And of course, with the Rotary Public Health Fellowship and Rotary District 6990 and to Dr. Imelda Medina. Um, let's give credit to where credit is due. Actually, it is Dr. Imelda Medina that noticed the need in the community as a community advocate that she is for such a training. And she has been pushing us at the Human Trafficking Academy for quite some time. And actually she parted with all of these brilliant doctors that we have here today. So I want to also take the opportunity to thank uh, Dr. Medina and also my own staff is also co-director of the, of the uh, webinar we are dealing with today, um, Liza Smoker, uh, used to be practicing attorney for many times, but now for over two years and a half, she works here with me at the Human Trafficking Academy and also my staff, uh, Carla Garcia too. So Dr. Sheffer, I know that you are a proud graduate of the University of uh, Miami uh, School of Medicine. And I am sure that this is a proud moment for you too, just like you are still involved with your alma mater as visiting scholar faculty at the University of Miami School of Nursing and Health Studies. And uh, in the class of 1998, when you graduated, you were elected as ethics representative and inducted into the OGK Honor Society. And then your glory only flowed from there to the benefit of our community. 
Dr. Shepard, and I'm not going to read her resume because we have it there, but and it will take a very long time. But Dr. Shepard, we are so proud of the work that you have been doing. We are graced with your presence and we are blessed for the service that you've done in our community, starting from Congress with advocating for what you very strongly believe in, in legislation in our great state of Florida, in various task forces, in various non-governmental organization boards that advocate for healthcare professionals and in healthcare. And I know that you would be, I had to think of the moderator that would really be able to probe into and inquire deeply into the knowledge of the great experts that we have here today. So Dr. Shepard, we are blessed to have you with us today. The rest of the colleagues, thank you so very much for being here with us today. You have graced us with your presence and we look forward to the empowerment, intellectual empowerment in this intersection of healthcare and human trafficking today. God's blessings. Dr. Schaffer, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. It is my pleasure to be back with the St. Thomas School of Law Human Trafficking Academy. You're exactly right. When I got involved almost 11 years ago, you were one of the few people and one of the few institutions that really had pioneered this vision of advocating for our victims. And I'm eternally grateful for that because there wasn't a lot of information out there. And uh, I know that comes from straight from the heart, but I wanna thank everybody involved at St. Thomas for putting this on today. I wanna to thank Dr. Imelda, who I will introduce at the end, who was a big part of pulling this together. But frankly, your leadership and the leadership of St. Thomas School, School of Law has been incredible. So thank you for all you do to really make a difference. And I really wanna give the spotlight because like you, I don't wanna be the center of attention here. I really wanna throw it to my amazing colleagues. We have an incredible lineup of just superstar experts for you. Um, their resumes are very extensive. And if you wanna read about them, if you click on your program, you'll see the list of accomplishments, but it would take up probably 45 minutes to, to praise all of them. So what I'm gonna have them do is put them on, I'm gonna put them on the spot and have them talk for about a minute and a half, just to tell us who they are, what organization they represent. And if they so choose, maybe give us a little bit of insight as to what it was, what was the catalyst that drove them into the field of of helping this particular population of, of patients, because it's a very unique population. All our, all our patients are very special and they all have individual needs, but the human trafficking population is, is very distinct and it takes a, a certain type of practitioner to really make that difference and meet these patients where they're at. So I'm gonna start out with Dr. Al Haji. Would you give us an overview of who you are and, and what organization do you represent? Hi, Dr. Schaefer, thank you for having me. So I'm here with University of Miami Strike I first got involved with caring for trafficking survivors uh, actually during my residency training in 2016. It was my last year of uh, residency in psychiatry and I was asked to join the team um, by Dr. Newport. So that was my first introduction, to be honest with you. And you know, from there, I continued working with, with our collaborative care clinic, um, serving as a, as a psychiatry uh, mental health provider. Um, I did that in my uh, residency, my fellowship, and then once I graduated, um, I started to supervise uh, other fellows and trainees in our clinic to train them uh, on trauma-informed care and care for survivors. Um, and we actually created an elective now uh, to help our psychiatry residents train in this area. So I was about to say I was gonna embarrass a former professor, um, but she did teach my favorite course at the University of Miami School of Medicine. She did medical ethics, law and social policy. And it really got the message of what we're trying to cover today, which is victim-centered approach and human trafficking victims. It really talks about you know, the, the balance between, I know you have a lot of lawyers on, on this, uh, on this um, webinar right now watching in, and I want them to know they have an important role because medicine and law do go hand in hand. And ethics, to me, is the one uniting factor across all of our professions. So, Dr. Corrales, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and what was your intersection into the field of human trafficking? So, at the risk of dating myself, Heidi was my student. Um, and of course, I was a child at the time. <laughs> but if one Heidi Schaefer is worth a thousand students at the University of Miami. 
Uh, actually, the Thrive Clinic began as a health law student pathway. It began with a student and her mentor um, who did a project, and it was Jonelle Potter and Julie Jane, um, the student and the mentor. Uh, and they uh, wanted to learn more about this problem and actually went to Homeland Security, participated in learning more about it. And um, that was, if you will, the birth of the idea that healthcare for victims and survivors of human traffic was non-existent. It was basically in the ERs, hidden in primary care and some of the specialty clinics, but it was certainly not a concerted, educated effort to provide um, the kind of care that these um, patients um, require. I have an MD degree and a JD degree, uh, all at the University of Miami, but I'm really privileged to have St. Thomas's invitation uh, to be able to share with you our journey uh, and uh, working with my colleagues, Dr. Al-Haji and Dr. Symes has been a privilege as well. Next up, I'm gonna ask Dr. Mezik, can you please introduce yourself and give us a brief overview of how you got involved with human trafficking? Hello. Hi. Thank you very much for this invitation and the opportunity to participate in this panel. Um, yes, uh, we'll say a few words about myself. Uh, <clears throat> I was born in Lima, the uh, son of a Peruvian mother and a Yugoslavian father, and uh, studied medicine there. And then I came to the United States to study psychiatry. I completed my residency training at Ohio State University, where I also completed a PhD degree in mathematical psychology. It was my area of research is the diagnosis. And uh, then completed my uh, dissertation at Stanford University where I had my first academic job in psychiatry uh, within the, the general area of, of diagnosis from statistical to clinical to uh, cultural uh, aspects of that. And uh, uh, then I continue to um, focus on, the, on diagnosis throughout my career. I was a member of the task force of the American Psychiatric Association for the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the third and fourth uh, editions. And uh, then uh, became the chair of the classification section of the World Psychiatric Association. And eventually I became secretary general and president of the World Psychiatric Association. Uh, later on, I uh, actually during my presidency, we started a program on person-centered psychiatry and after completing my period of office there, I uh, communicated with the World Psychiatric Association, with the World Medical Association and the uh, World Health Organization to uh, explore the development of uh, a broader uh, perspective that we call person-centered medicine and health. And that is what uh, I'm mostly doing in addition to my uh, current uh, full-time position at uh, uh, Mount Sinai School of Medicine as a professor of uh, psychiatry. And as a president of WPA, I was uh, uh, also in touch with uh, one of our sections, which was on torture survivors. And I had the opportunity to uh, work with very distinguished colleagues who devoted their lives to dealing with uh, victims of torture. <clears throat> and so, uh, that, as well as the, the fact that uh, my interest on the person, whatever the role it may be, as a patient, as a, as a health professional, or as a family member, etc., uh, uh, made very interesting for me to, li to uh, listen about your uh, uh, program. And, and now I am very happy to, to be here and will be pleased to participate in the discussions that will take place. Wow. Well, thank, thank you. you so much for being here and thank you for your expertise. Uh, quite a resume. We're really happy to have you all the way from Mount Sinai in New York. Next up is Dr. Stephen Symes. Tell us about yourself. Hi, Dr. Schaefer and everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Stephen Symes. I'm an associate professor of medicine at Miller School of Medicine. 
Um, my background really centers uh, as an internist, uh, taking care of HIV patients for the past 25 years. We're truly, again, interdisciplinary care and focusing on the social determinants of health in um, making sure that patients move to wellness was such a critical aspect. I also uh, worked on trauma-informed care with our medical students at Miller, uh, running a torture asylum clinic, uh, helping lawyers um, uh, provide a medical attestation for people seeking asylum in the United States to immigration judges. And I got involved in this other trauma-informed care, caring for um, uh, human trafficking survivors with Dr. Potter and Dr. Corrales. Um, and I think, again, the model is very similar, taking care of individuals who've gone through trauma and truly need interdisciplinary care that encompasses the role of a primary care provider like myself. So it's a pleasure to be here and contribute to the discussion. Thank you, Dr. Symes. Another uh, professor that I enjoyed um, teaching me back in the days at U of M in the dinosaur ages. Uh, we're, we're all getting up there, but I, I'm just so honored to have all of you take the time out to be here today and educate on this important topic. So actually, uh, Dr. Patty covered a lot of the next question I was going to ask. And Dr. Symes, I'm going to throw this one at you. If you can give us about five to seven minutes, talk about what is human trafficking. There's a lot of confusion as to what it really means. Uh, people confuse it with human smuggling. They think about drug trafficking, but they're not the same thing. If you can talk about the two major forms we're going to discuss today are labor and sex, of course, and then maybe an overall prevalence. And, and as she kind of hit on, the 88% of, of victims that we're traditionally seeing through our ERs and we're missing, if you could talk a little bit about where the he healthcare sector is in regards to seeing these patients and um, are we improving? I feel like we are, but I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Thanks, Dr. Symes. Thanks again. So again, when we talk about human trafficking, um, I think we all have this idealistic idea in our heads about what it is. Uh, and there's certainly a definition that Dr. Patty talked about that involves coercion, that involves, again, exploitation of others. And so I think that the term slavery is very appropriate. But I wanted to kind of focus on something you mentioned, which is this idea about human trafficking, being involved in crossing borders. And, um, and another popular misconception about human trafficking um, also involving sex. Um, and so that really helps us to kind of draw this distinction that uh, human trafficking, which is a $150 billion industry, right? And it really is an industry um, uh, and a business. And that's why it's been so successful. Uh, um, really focuses on the exploitation of individuals. And if we look at what that exploitation involves, it's two main forms. It's sex, um, and again, we hear a lot about that and sex trafficking. But I think even more important, if you look at the numbers, is labor trafficking. And labor trafficking means sweatshops, it means agricultural industry, the hotel industry, the entertainment industry, it involves individuals who are taken advantage of in terms of domestic uh, servitude. Um, it involves child labor. And again, the trafficking part really comes across when there's other individuals who are taking advantage through coercion, through fraud, through deception, or just exploitation of individuals. And again, there's this famous phrase that they talk about, which is, you know, in terms of uh, um, as an illicit trade or business, um, if you are a drug smuggler or a trafficker, you can sell your product once. But the thing about, uh, you know, when you're involved in the trafficking of human individuals, um, one of the reasons it's so lucrative is that you can sell people over and over and over again. And that's the, the thing that is really very disturbing. We also think about human trafficking just, uh, you know, um, um, about who is trafficked in the United States, for instance, most of the individuals who are trafficked are, are not coming from other countries. They're actually um, individuals who are U.S. citizens. Um, so we do have individuals who are foreign born, but the majority are actually U.S. citizens. And it's usually, again, young uh, individuals, mostly girls, uh, average age is about the age of 12. 
um, but also boys, average age or the age of 11, again, who end up in very unfortunate circumstances and being taken advantage of. Um, so those are some of the statistics. The other thing, again, I would just mention is that Florida, um, with its agricultural industry and its tourism industry, is a state that is where human trafficking is very prevalent, number three in the nation. Um, and you can just imagine, again, some of the other places where you're likely to see this. Any place where, again, there is going to be a, you know, a thriving uh, a tourism industry and a thriving um, agricultural hotel industry, you're going to see a lot of human trafficking. So I think that sets the stage a little bit for what human trafficking is, what it involves, who it affects, and uh, hopefully again, uh, an entryway into further discussion of how we can um, work to address it. Excellent, thank you so much, Dr. Symes. So obviously uh, we are seeing these patients in practice. Some of us recognize that, some of us don't, but we need to always keep this front and center and make sure we think about this as a differential diagnosis, especially in our minors. Um, the, the law states, at least in the United States, that a minor that is under the age of 18 cannot consent. So a commercial sex act that's done to them, that automatically qualifies as sex trafficking. Unfortunately, we don't have that same protection under the labor trafficking statute. Um, and I do think that's part of the reason we don't see a lot of, of media coverage about labor trafficking. Plus it's a little harder to find and, and it's a little harder to prove. So I, I'm really glad that you brought up both of them. Um, we see pesticide poisoning in the fields here in Florida, just as much as we see girls presenting with STDs and multiple abortions due to sex trafficking. And it's really important we highlight both. So I really appreciate your time on that, Dr. Symes. So now Dr. Mezek, I'm gonna ask you since you're uh, a guru about the psychiatry side of all this. Uh, from a psychiatry perspective, how can we effectively treat these patients? We know that they're they're difficult to, to they come in, they present with many different issues, um, but how, how do you find success? And also, can you kind of go over just, just an overview of the mental effects that we see in these patients versus the physical health effects? So both mental and physical we're seeing in combination, but can you kind of drive home, what are the consequences when we fail as clinicians to really meet the needs of these patients? Dr. Mezek, the floor is yours. Yes, uh, uh, we'll address your questions. Uh, concerning uh, assessment first, uh, uh, one needs to be as broad as possible uh, for several reasons. Uh, one is because uh, uh, the abuse uh, the victim may be uh, exposed to uh, may involve a uh, broad range of physical and, and psychological uh, problems. Uh, also because there are risk factors as well as protective factors that may uh, be important to identify in order to then work with them uh, to try to help the person uh, to recover and to advance his or her health. And, and also because uh, in addition to what we can observe and uh, directly monitor, uh, it is crucial to ask the person uh, what are the experiences that are most problematic for them, as well as what they want from us, from the professionals who are trying to help. Uh, we cannot assume uh, that we know for sure what uh, is what they need the most. Uh, we certainly have good ideas, but in addition to just dealing with uh, problems that we can observe, it is a, a very important to pay attention to what they have to say in terms of uh, their experiences as well as what they, they wish. Uh, this issue is, a, is a particularly important concerning abuse. Uh, there is a, a uh, very moving story of Dorothea Bach, uh, uh, a woman with a diagnosis of schizophrenia, who during the Nazi uh, times in Germany uh, was uh, abused physically, was uh, sterilized against her will. And uh, uh, she reported later on, uh, when she became 70 years of age, that uh, what was worst 
was not uh, all the mistreatment that she uh, endured, but the fact that doctors didn't think that she had anything interesting to say. Uh, this, uh, this is some, uh, it's a reminder to how crucial it is to, uh, to attend to the person's perspectives. And that is also why our movement, our programmatic movement of person-centered medicine and health focuses on the person rather than on organs or diseases. Of course, we have to pay attention to problems with organs and, and diseases, but uh, the main focus should be on the person who experiences those diseases or complaints. And uh, concerning uh, treatment, uh, uh, one, of course, has to use all our armamentarium to deal with the problems that we see, including biological, psychological, and social uh, therapies. Uh, but <clears throat> it has been said more recently that uh, perhaps more important than to suppress uh, negative emotions such as depression or anxiety, the most common complaints, is to promote positive emotions. The, the sense of uh, hope, uh, uh, the sense that life may have meaning. In fact, a uh, life project that may need to be reconstructed by the person. And we as health professionals have a crucial role to play in, in stimulating and encouraging and guiding uh, persons, whether as victims or otherwise, to uh, find a, a purpose in life, uh, to have a feeling of growth, so that uh, uh, with such a life project uh, for, for themselves, they may be able to more effectively deal with the complaints they have to, to they, they have. Again, most likely depression and anxiety, the most common complaints that underline all kinds of uh, psychiatric and mental health problems. So the, I think these are some of the key issues, both for the assessment and for the uh, uh, therapy that we can provide people who uh, present looking for help. Thank you very much. I appreciate the uh, insight and I love the idea that we focus on the positive as much as we sometimes find ourselves focusing on the negative. And I think that's a really hopeful way of treating these patients from a, psych a psychiatric perspective. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Alhaji. What I'm hoping she'll talk about a little bit is the vulnerabilities that we find in these patients. Um, there's a little bit of a myth that people think that certain people are exempt from being trafficked. Um, I have people I know that are currently on dating websites. And to me, they're being groomed right now by Romeo pimps and they're my age. And so the reality is everybody and anybody could be a victim. And frankly, we're seeing pretty much anybody and everybody, whether it's an individual or an organization, uh, be the pimps in these, in these, um, in these uh, corporations at the corporation level for labor trafficking and also at the sex tra trafficking level. It's, you know, it's almost organized crime sometimes. But that said, there are certain specific risk factors we're seeing where populations are, are more vulnerable than others. And so I would love Dr. Alhaji to kind of cover which populations are, are you seeing that are most vulnerable? And uh, if you have any insight and in, in how do we kind of get to these patients before they become a true victim of trafficking? Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Schaefer. So as you very nicely mentioned, you and Dr. Sainz, there's no single profile. For a trafficked person. I think we all have our biases and ideas of what a trafficker should look like and what a trafficked person should look like. But in reality, trafficking can affect men, women, children of all backgrounds, including socioeconomic status, uh, gender, uh, faith, uh, education, or even immigration status. However, what we do know is that there are specific risk factors that could increase someone's vulnerability to be trafficked, right? So some of these risk factors, I would say the most notable one is having a history of childhood trauma. We know from the ACE study, which is a, a huge study um, done with over 17,000 participants, that having a history of childhood trauma, whether it's physical, sexual, emotional abuse, 
witnessing abuse or even having a parent with a history of mental health issues or substance use issues can put a person at risk of developing things like PTSD, depression, substance use disorder. They're also at a higher risk of suicide. So that's, that's one of the main uh, risk factors that we know about. I can tell you that from our clinic, most of our patients have some form of childhood trauma in their lives. Also, when it comes to youth and teenagers, we found that patients who are unsheltered or runaway youths or even youths who are coming out of the juvenile justice system or foster care could be at a higher risk. Patients who tend to be isolated and have limited support. So again, if we think about marginalized populations, so for example, patients from the LGBTQI community, so they tend to have more issues with perhaps family dynamics, may not have as much support and can be more vulnerable as well. Um, having pre-existing mental health issues, substance use, or even physical or learning disabilities can put someone at risk. And finally, I wanna highlight the issue of, of migrants, right? So patients who are in this country or even other countries who are refugees or immigrants, especially ones who do not speak the same language of where they live, can be at a higher risk. So these are things that could push someone into being trafficked, but then there are also the coercive techniques that were mentioned earlier that can keep the person in the vicious cycle of trafficking, right? So the trafficker may use techniques like, you know, taking time to earn the person's trust, uh, framing the picture that they're their new family, they're their chosen family, or that they're their romantic partners, and perhaps give them hopes of a steady job, uh, perhaps a better life, um, or even promise things like, you know, housing, food, shelter, and that can entice someone to, to be involved in trafficking, even though they may not know that this is trafficking, right? Um, the other thing is that, you know, traffickers may use threats. So for example, if someone is undocumented, they may threaten a person that they will call the authorities on them, right? And that perpetuates the cycle of trafficking. Something that I think uh, should not be underestimated is trauma bonding, right? Which is when patients may have uh, uh, an unhealthy emotional attachment to their trafficker. And that can really um, affect the care and the recovery of the patient. Um, the final thing I'll mention is, you know, the risk factors in terms of the industries, right? So, you know, the industries that put a person at a higher risk are ones that are um, underregulated and underpaid. So massage parlors, um, hotel industries, um, the service industry, agriculture, um, travel salesmen, um, those kind of jobs um, may, I guess, have uh, a higher risk of someone being involved in a trafficking situation. Okay, excellent. That is a very thorough um, overview of all of the different risk factors and certainly uh, past childhood trauma is something we should be looking at even in the field of internal medicine, which is my field and Dr. Symes's field, we should be looking and asking those questions. We now have ICD-10 uh, ability to, to bill even for those questions. We should be asking about what's your prior history, um, whether confirmed or suspected, both either active trafficking or frankly, childhood sexual abuse when 80 to 90% of patients uh, present with previous child uh, sexual abuse, we know that they're much at a, at a much higher risk to the tune of, I think it's 88, I think it's 88 percent, the risk of them becoming arrested for uh, prostitution later in life if they have a history, a prior sexual abuse history as a child. That's something we can't ignore as physicians. So I think you did a great job going over all the high ticket items, so to speak. But the truth is, at the end of the day, as we've all said, Anybody and everybody can be a, a victim and we just have to be very vigilant and we have to do the right thing for these patients if we even think they're, they're getting exposed to this issue at all. So at this time, I'm gonna get into what I consider the nuts and bolts. I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Corrales, who I guess will get a tag team here with Dr. Symes to really get into, okay, great. We, we think we have a patient who could be in the realm of human trafficking. How do we really make that next step of connection um, because we have to build a rapport with these patients in a way that makes them feel safe. This isn't your standard patient. Not that we don't wanna make all our patients feel safe, but these are literally um, 
sometimes combative patients. I have yet to ever have a patient come in and say, I'm a victim of trafficking. I don't think that's ever happened to anybody I know either. Um, and it takes a lot of work and effort and we have to plant that seed. It might take multiple visits, but at the end of the day, it's our job as a physician. And when we say we're gonna do no harm, we really have to stick to that mantra and that ethical oath. So I'm gonna ask Dr. Corrales if she can go over kind of how do you identify these victims Let's get a little bit into the nitty gritty of, let's say on a history, what kind of questions should be asked? What are the common presentations? On the physical, physical exam, what kind of red flags would we look for? And then honestly, how do we build that rapport? Because we have to marry this with the topic that's at hand, this whole conversation is about victim-centered approach. How do we approach these victims in a way that's meaningful to them, recognizing they've been through trauma, or they're going to be shortly going through trauma because obviously they've already been exposed to something. And at the end of the day, how do we really do this with an ethical lens where we're not violating their confidentiality, but we are reporting where necessary and all those other concerns that we think about HIPAA and just kind of giving the patients the autonomy to decide just like we would with any other patient. We can give them informed consent, tell them the benefits and the risks of a procedure and the alternatives. And they can say, you know what, doc, I'm not interested. I appreciate it and they can walk out our door and we have to be okay with that because it's not our job to shove our opinions down onto our patients. But this is a very unique population. So I really wanna give um, Dr. Corrales and Dr. Steven Symes, let's say about 20 minutes to kind of go over the nuts and bolts if you don't mind. Thank you so much, guys. All right, thank you so much. <laughs> um, we're gonna just show you a few slides that I think illustrate some of the main principles that you were talking about. And uh, I'll go first here, just to illustrate that uh, when we talk about trafficking and the responsibility of the medical profession, many of the individuals have been in the medical system before. Um, and this has been validated by multiple studies. Now, part of that recognizes the fact that uh, um, we aren't looking as medical professionals. Um, we're not looking not looking at the clues and the cues which are out there. And the other part is so that many individuals don't recognize that they are being trafficked and are not ready to be rescued. And these are two important factors that really, again, have to raise our awareness and heighten our awareness when we're thinking about this as an issue. A big clue can be the medical consequences of what you might see in a trafficked individual. Um, we talked about physical injuries um, and we have to start to put that together. Does the individual have multiple pregnancies, forced or unsafe abortions? Um, do they have a high rate of sexually transmitted illnesses? Um, HIV, hepatitis B, um, you know, HPV, um, cervical dysplasia, are there higher rates of tuberculosis? In someone who's being trafficked, a lot of times you'll hear about individuals being undernourished or poorly nourished. Um, in a lot of our rescued individuals, they use food as a compensatory mechanism. And we see a lot of obesity and a lot of uh, metabolic syndrome. Um, are they missing proper immunizations? Is there a significant drug addictions? And I think, again, we've talked a little bit about the psychological trauma, psychiatric disorders, and physical illnesses. And in the next slide, I'm gonna let Pat Corrales um, just tell us a little bit more about some of the things that we'll see and dig into. If we can go to the next slide. So one of the hallmarks has been chronic pain syndromes. Um, they're usually atypical, and um, there's very little study done to help us understand um, if pain is altered because of the years of trauma, or pain is really altered because of the years of psych psychiatric uh, changes that have occurred in the neurophysiology, uh, especially with childhood trauma. But you can see that certainly there are higher rates of these uh, atypical chronic pain syndromes that tends to get these patients very similar to interpersonal violence patients uh, listed as um, somatization or Munchausen's and uh, often uh, lead to big workups with very little uh, return. 
uh, and then finally label the patient as, a, as the proverbial croc. Um, fatigue, again, is this a neurobiological change that occurs? Uh, we're now talking about coronavirus and cytokine storms. Um, some of the changes that occur, especially when you have childhood trauma and childhood tra trafficking, um, mimic some of the changes you see in these cytokine storms with neurotransmitters heightened um, that can lead to these problems. Memory problems. This is a particular um, uh, bane of especially law enforcement uh, because a lot of these patients have had these changes and this is how they've coped. Um, either they've coped to uh, basically um, disassociate themselves from the events or because they've become numb to their environment or because again, this is how the changes in their brain and there've been some studies um, with neuroradiology to show particular um, changes in parts of the brain that mediate this. And so these patients, when they come back into the world of having to basically testify or go back to school or hold a job, manifest these abnormalities and often are set up for failure. So these are recognitions that all of us have to have, as well as the weight loss and some common problems of uh, dizziness, vertigo, and again, autonomic dysfunction that occurs. Next slide. We've talked about the battered women syndrome, the Stockholm syndrome, trauma bonds. PTSD in this um, childhood trauma patients in particular is actually higher than it is in interpersonal violence and in war injury or even mass violence victims, which is very remarkable and has long-term consequences. Uh, I'm not gonna go over these problems except to say once again, when you look at these patients, it's a spectrum. It's not gonna be a snapshot in time. It's really gonna be a, mo a moving picture. And so you, really can't just give them a pill or give them a type of therapy and think that you're going to fix the problem. And I think many of us in medicine get impatient when things don't get better right away, particularly PTSD. And again, I wanna emphasize for um, law enforcement, when you're putting these patients on the stand and um, they basically look detached, they look like they have no emotions, um, they have difficulty concentrating. And if you're a defense attorney, you're going to go ahead and basically mine this in order to get your client off by um, making the victim look like a liar or look like they're not matching their stories correctly. And in often um, these patients, especially if they're childhood um, patients, uh, of the age will be re-traumatized by the process of law enforcement. So we have to be very careful in law enforcement situations. And I'm gonna show you some data also in the medical um, field, how we really have to be extremely careful in our routine ways by which we take histories and we share histories. Um, uh, and that's one of the founding ways by which the Thrive Clinic and the Thrive Project has changed the way we approach um, trauma-centered care. So really think about these victims um, in the sense that they have medical stressors, they have family stressors, they're having a hard time coping at, in a work situation. So even if we um, save them, even if we take them out of their... Um, slaved them. Um, we are facing long-term problems that have consequences for the rest of their life. And I think what Dr. Mezik said about giving them hope, it's critical to address this as a moving picture, as something in which we have to recognize that it isn't just the medical issues or the immediate law enforcement issues that we're dealing with, but we're really talking about 
um, reintroducing them into life itself, into having a future and being able to cope with stressors, cope with their physical problems, and with um, basically the social deprivation that they've had to endure makes it harder for them to come back into that world. I want to emphasize that this particular area, biological and behavioral mechanisms of trauma, is, is a ripe research field right now, currently, that all of us are um, basically contributing to. We're learning more and more about the effects, especially of childhood trauma and stressors uh, of human trafficking um, in particular, uh, as it relates to changes in neural pathways that make them much more vulnerable to poorer outcomes. As a result of these changes, not only do they have a hard time coming back into society and interacting in normal ways and having the likelihood that they're gonna go back into the world of human trafficking because they can't make it in our world, um, we're also seeing changes in terms of, as I said to you, the cytokine stressors, they have higher rates of those particular inflammatory markers that are associated with cancer, with cardiovascular risk. They have risky behaviors, smoking, drug abuse, alcohol, um, overeating, undereating, which lead to um, a greater risks of actually cardiovascular events, stroke, MIs in younger ages, and as a result, higher mortality rates. So just the impact of being a human trafficking victim and being saved places them at a greater risk for dying, not during their trafficking, but actually years later because of the um, effect long-term uh, on their lives, which is why it's so important to prevent human trafficking and not just rescue them. So people have called for screening for trauma exposure because of this impact. And there are more and more um, screening uh, uh, surveys that are being validated now that are trying to be included in the medical history. But the most important thing that we've learned is really that um, working with partnerships like Homeland Security, like the state attorney's office and other sites, that trauma-informed care is actually our role. We're, we're not law enforcement, um, we're not social workers, um, but we are um, healthcare professionals and it's incumbent upon us to know how to um, set up a healthcare system that is made for helping these patients come out and be able to function in the world and not re-traumatize them because of the way we, we care for them. Next slide. When you see these patients and you are all seeing them, okay? It doesn't matter whether you're in an ER, a primary care clinic or a specialty clinic, we are all seeing these patients. We're seeing them in our schools. We're seeing them at our jobs. We're seeing them on our airplane flight. So it's important to recognize um, when people are being exploited and trafficked. And uh, they may present in very typical ways that have been mentioned before. There are some uh, signs, the, the markings, the brandings, the tattoos that are very unique and in unusual places. Um, the suspicious companion that looks highly solicitous uh, usually an older person that it could be a, a woman. It does not have to be the proverbial pimp. Uh, and it could even be a family member. And they are essentially um, clinging uh, to, to the victim, to the survivor. And um, they're making sure that they don't talk. Whether they're actually telling them and coaching them what to say or whether they're just uh, warning them that they better not say certain things. Um, oftentimes uh, they pay in cash. Oftentimes uh, the uh, person does not have an ID, does not have um, control over their identity papers, uh, passports, licenses, and so forth. 
So those are some clues. When we interview these patients, it's very important to know that you are not re-traumatizing them, that you are showing them compassion and that you're not judgmental. And the interview has to be done in private. Uh, I don't care how busy the office is or how uh, busy the ER is, um, you have to basically carve out a confidential space. You cannot use an interpreter who's a family member or um, uh, you know, the person who's standing there. It really has to be an official interpreter who is schooled in HIPAA, who also is not judgmental and is gonna give you um, true information. The first thing you uh, don't need to say is, what's your immigration status? Show me your documentation. Are you a trafficking victim? That, that's just not going to get you an answer, okay? Um, let the person describe what happened to them. Um, let them tell their story, encourage them to speak. And um, the most important thing we can do is listen. The very important thing we have to do is establish trust. And I, I think, you know, in the Thrive Clinic in particular, we have learned that we don't ask the history over and over again, that we take the history once and that document is then shared with the rest of the providers who come to the patient. I don't know about you all, but if you've ever been to Jackson or to a big hospital, it's huge. It's um, intimidating. And so one of the first things that we did was establish a single place, a single waiting room where the person can feel safe, can feel um, that they are being listened to and they're not having to repeat the same facts over and over again and just re-traumatizing themselves. Questions that can be asked that get at the gist of what's going on are really generic questions. Um, can you basically move freely in your work or your living place? Do you, are you locked in at night? Um, are you allowed to have consensual partners or non-consensual partners? It's a way of asking about human trafficking without putting the person um, into a re-traumatized area. These come from the US Department of HHS um, it's not easy to ask these questions. Uh, and unlike interpersonal violence patients, they're not gonna freely tell you that they're trafficked. This is not a group that will easily admit when asked, um, but you still have to be able to ask in a way that centers on the patient and respects them as human beings and gives them a chance to tell their story without you looking at a watch, okay? This is not a 10 minute interview. Um, on the other hand, it can be a very succinct interview. It is doable. It will um, reap a reward in, in the end. Validate the experience. It's so important in establishing trust to um, express to your patients um, that you see them as human beings you respect their judgment. Uh, you know, we worry about HIPAA. I, I really worry not about HIPAA, but about common sense. Common sense is if this is a, an adult, you're going to respect their judgment as to whether they're safe and whether they need help and whether they need help to get out immediately. Um, if they're a child, you have to think of them as a child and be able to protect them and be and are required to report them because of the safety issues of children. We're also seeing more and more vulnerable adults coming into this situation. A new form of human trafficking is getting vulnerable adults and, and taking their disability checks um, and gathering them uh, for that purpose. Um, so, you know, it, it really is a spectrum uh, but the idea and the message to um, the person is, we're here to prioritize your needs. We're here to make sure you're safe. We will help protect your family. A lot of these um, 
patients don't realize that there are laws that will give them um, protection, uh, everything from a visa to um, the ability to uh, get victim reparations that will help them. So I think it's critical that if, if they don't know this stuff because they've been threatened and told out, we'll get you immigrated, we'll get you locked up. Um, they need to know um, that you're there to help them any way you can. You know, we all want to be supermen and women. We want to fix it. And we want it to go away. Um, that This is not a quick fix. Uh, you need to work with others to make um, basically uh, this happen. And it's very frustrating when you're unable to make these changes. And so we tend to press sometimes too much. And when you do that, you take away the patient's most important feeling, which is that they have control over their decisions. So um, it's important to recognize that, to respect them, to address our own biases. So many people have asked me, and I'm sure Heidi as well, this is just, um, you know, pimps and prostitutes. What's different about it? Well, I think it's different because of the scope um, and the uh, magnitude of the problem. And the problem is bigger than just sexual trauma. Uh, it, it really involves all kinds of ways by which some people are able to control other people for profit. So we need to address our own biases and we need to plant the seeds of trust in our patients, which is to respect um, them, to care about them and to really underscore their humanity because they've not had that ever done for them. It takes everyone to make this go away. It takes everybody from healthcare providers to community leaders and activists that you're going to hear uh, and everybody in the law enforcement and legal community, I don't care what kind of lawyer you are, um, to recognize that this isn't going to go away by just um, saving the victim and getting them out of the situation for the moment. Social services are huge. They have not had bank accounts. How are they going to manage their money? How are they going to know how to shop at a grocery store for good um, uh, nutritional uh, foods? How are they going to know how to interact and handle anger and stress? So that was really the foundation of, of the Thrive Clinic. Um, the Thrive Project, as I said to you, began as a student project and with Jonelle um, Potter uh, and funding from the Justice Department uh, actually from religious uh, groups um, and churches, we've been able to pull, pull together a uh, core clinical uh, program. Uh, Drs. Al-Haji and Symes are basically the stalwarts who provide medical care. We have OBGYN and we partnered also with pediatrics now to handle adolescents. Jackson Memorial Hospital, donated a clinic uh, site for us. And um, our providers are pro bono, they work for free. We've been able also to have our uh, specialists provide care as well, pro bono. Um, Jackson allows us to see patients in this clinic uh, in a referral manner uh, if they are part of uh, a referral from a homeless uh, shelter, be it Camilla's House, Lotus House, um, uh, Project Gold, uh, Glory House. These are um, given a designation of homeless so Jackson can basically write off and we're allowed to get labs, x-rays and see these patients in this clinic. There's one entrance into the clinic, there's one room the specialists come to that room, um, the nurse comes to that room, the clerk comes to that room. The patients are guided by a navigator who takes them wherever they need to go. Uh, and um, whether it's to the pharmacy, to the specialty clinics, and, and that's how we've, we've worked. 
It's a safe place. It's non-judgmental. We have one chart that everybody can uh, access so we don't repeat the history over and over again. We really emphasize their strengths. And it's critical to recognize that not only the medical care is important, but really what Dr. Al-Haji has been able to establish with psychiatric ongoing trauma-informed care and therapy is uh, probably um, a very critical part of healing these patients. As I said, the most important thing that these providers have been able to do is establish trust. Um, we try to do that with all our patients, but it's critical here. Uh, and also to re- organize their thinking that they are human beings um, with the power to heal themselves with our help. So um, I think I made the time. I'm not sure. It probably went over. Oh, but. you did a great job. Thank you, Dr. Corrales, Dr. Symes. I, how you compiled probably a 25-hour lecture into uh, about 20 minutes. You covered all the important things. And I think the most important part of that was letting these people have their voice, giving them control. They've been controlled by so many people. And finally, we are in some ways the one, you know, discipline that will listen to them and hear them out and then give them the autonomy to decide what they want to do. And maybe at that visit, they don't want to do anything. And that's okay. At least you let them know there's resources you're here to help and they may or may not come back. But it was an amazing um, overview of everything that we needed to cover. So I appreciate that. So now, Dr. Alhaji, um, can you quickly go over the cultural concerns in the victim-centered care of survivors? Um, like, how do we really implement this into practice? What do we need? And I, I think one of the things that was mentioned by Dr. Corrales was the multidisciplinary team. That's important. But what else can we do to kind of make sure that we're meeting the victim where they're really at and, and giving them all different outlets to choose from? Thanks, Dr. Schaefer. So I'll try to keep this brief, um, but you know, cultural humility is vital in all practices of medicine, not only mental health. And it's important because the patient's cultural identity can really shape the way that they communicate, not only about their trauma, but also other things, um, how they understand their mental and physical health issues, how they seek help, and also what they expect out of the care. Um, and, you know, the, the treatment and the approach should be tailored to incorporate the patient's culture into the plan. So one of the, the main things are the most common issues that come up is, you know, one is language. Um, so, you know, if there's a language barrier between the provider and the patient, things get lost in translation and you'll end up getting a wrong diagnosis and a wrong uh, treatment as a consequence. So it's important to try to match the provider with the patient um, in a perfect world with the with a provider who speaks the same language, but if not, to use an official uh, language line or an interpreter and to make sure that you have enough time for that evaluation if you're using an interpreter. Um, keeping in mind that, you know, the interpreter may need to speak the pa patient's dialect, not only the language, to not miss any critical information. The second thing is, is the diagnostic considerations. Um, so we tend to practice you know, Western medicine here. Um, I'll give an example of a patient that we had from, from East Asia. Um, she had a lot of distress and anxiety related to her history of sex trafficking. And she was completely opposed to any, you know, uh, what we use in FDA uh, approved medication in terms of first line treatments for anxiety. She only wanted uh, natural supplements, acupuncture. So we said, okay, great, go, go to your acupuncturist, we'll give you melatonin. And she was happy with that, you know, um, and, and I've heard she's doing well. Um, so, so that's important too, to tailor the way that we practice. The third thing is, is the patient's perception and, and culture related to trauma. So, you know, culture can affect the way the person interprets their trauma, uh, how they respond to the trauma, what they... Uh, find in terms of the meaning of their symptoms and how they relate to it. And again, as I mentioned earlier, how they seek help. So, you know, something to keep in mind too, that they might also be triggered by prior healthcare experiences. So it's important to try to fit what the patient feels the most comfortable with. The most common thing is, you know, a female patient with a history of sexual abuse may prefer a female therapist, for example, right? So trying to match that. Um, 
and to really focus on you know factors that make them resilient right and and the positive factors that also can be incorporated into their wellness um the last thing i'll mention is you know um how to establish trust and rapport based on the patient's background a is to have a diverse team and as part of the multidisciplinary team i know that with our team you know we have uh you know staff men women uh, black white Hispanic, et cetera, um, who speak different languages. And I think that helps with establishing the trust, which can take a while. Um, and then, you know, be creative. Um, for patients who are marginalized, they may benefit from things like, you know, faith-based groups. Um, patients of the LGBTQ community may benefit from support groups. Um, pairing the patient with a survivor advocate who's had a similar experience can also help with their recovery process. And lastly, you know, just to keep it brief is listen to your patients. Obviously, it's very hard for us to know all the cultures in the world, but the patients really know best. Um, obviously, we can't learn everything from our patients. We also need to do our own research, but we need to listen to what the patient believes will also help with their recovery process. Wow, that was very uh, comprehensive. I really appreciate that. We always have to meet these patients where they're at. And even though we come in with our own biases and we all have them and we really need to look at that, like Dr. Prella said, our job is to really listen to our patients and give them the best possible outcomes. And so at this time, um, I know our time is short. We could talk for hours and hours. I'm just gonna throw it out there to any four of the panelists. Does anybody have some burning take home message that they wanna kind of say that we maybe didn't cover? If not, I'm going to uh, put a plug in that I think everybody who's watching, whether you're in the medical field or not, the one thing you can do is phone in to the national hotline here in the United States. If you're in the national United States, it's 888-3737-888, 888-3737-888. If you're outside the United States, the number you can reach, because a lot of you are calling in from other countries, is 866-872-872. 4973. If you see something, please report it. It's important that we can save a life. And as uh, many of the experts told you today, this isn't a one and done. These, these pimps don't just have one or two girls or boys or adults working for them. They might have several victims and we can really change the trajectory just by making that phone call. So I wanna thank everybody who joined us on the panel today. You're all amazing experts. I appreciate your time, your expertise. And at this time, I'm gonna introduce our next closing remarks speaker, Dr. Imelda Medina. Her title is that she's a health promotion and disease prevention chair of the Rotarian Public Health Fellowship. She's also president of Familias Unidas Internacional. I hope I said that right. Um, and what she's really gonna focus on is not obviously the victim-centered approach and the fact that these patients should be the center of all of our decisions at every time, whether psychological or physical health, it's all the same focus. But she's also going to talk about the importance of building partnerships and collaborations. She's a huge community advocate herself. And we know Thrive Clinic is, is up and running in Miami doing such great work. I know the University of, of Miami's School of Nursing is doing education across the board for all its nurses, including a really cool sim simulation lab, a different way to kind of learn about this in real time. But at the end of the day, how do we really help our patients and vulnerable populations? It's by realizing that we don't know everything and we do need those community partners. So I really wanna introduce Dr. Imelda Medina and uh, let her know that we're really appreciative that she was the co-course director for today's event and kind of the impetus behind it. She did a gap analysis, found out that not surprisingly, there's a gap in this knowledge in the healthcare sector. And today she's bringing forward her knowledge. So Dr. Medina, take it away. Thank you, Dr. Schaefer. Human trafficking is a major public health issue, a serious crime, a severe violation of human rights, a threat to all. But there is hope. It is clear that in our health system at the global level, we need a fourth element to be added to the traditional 3P paradigm, prosecution, prevention, and prevention, to serve as the fundamental framework used around the world to combat human trafficking. The fourth element being partnership putting the person at the center of care, through which we can create a system where public health clinicians and community members work together to support the person, identify and care for those whom have suffered, are suffering, 
or are at risk of suffering trafficking. Healthcare providers are in a unique position to help. Healthcare providers interact with persons who are vulnerable and provide services to 50 to 80% of victims of human trafficking, often while they remain under their trafficker's control. University of Miami Trafficking Healthcare Resources and Interdisciplinary Victim Services and Education Trial Clinic is an excellent example of healthcare through which multidisciplinary services are provided to persons who are survivors of human trafficking. Services are provided with empathy and compassion, with providers extending themselves as full human beings with high ethical aspirations, working respectfully in collaboration and in an empowering manner, offering quality, comprehensive, trauma-informed care in a private setting, and by working with partner organizations to help strengthen every person's journey to freedom. Services are provided with ethical commitment, cultural sensitivity, holistic scope, relational focus, individualized care, and with common ground for diagnosis and care. At the global level, in addition to providing illness-related episodic care for trafficking victims, survivors, and persons at risk, local health systems can participate in education and community awareness, screening, person-centered and trauma-informed physical and mental health care, rehabilitation, referral, continuity of care, advocacy and policy engagement. Through partnership, we can support and replicate this model of care. We can come together in our communities around the world to do community service projects to help increase protective factors and decrease risk factors of human trafficking. And we can also deliver more trainings to healthcare providers in the communities we serve. The ultimate goal is to stop the exploitation before it happens. Together, we can make this happen. Together, we can help deliver better health for all and make this world a better place. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Medina, and thank you to the esteemed panel. What a treat indeed it was, like all good things. This also comes to an end, or not for sure, for long, we will come back again. So, uh, Dr. Sainz, Dr. Schaefer, Dr. Karalis, Dr. Alhaji, uh, Dr. Mesik and Dr. Medina, many thanks from the bottom of our heart for being part of this panel. And between the esteemed panel that we had here today and uh, our informed audience that is following us, we pretty much have represented here everyone that counts in the struggle against human trafficking. And it was absolutely soothing to the heart and also very much inspirational to hear that call for recognizing, acknowledging the humanity of our victims and survivors. And we all were singing, our esteemed panel was singing to the tune of hope. So let us all work together to bring that hope, to uplift the dignity of our victim survivors and have them turn into thrivers. And talking about that, I would invite uh, you all to join us again on February the 8th, which is the international, we have, we are celebrating International Day of uh, Prayer and Awareness on Human Trafficking. And we have a prayer service starting at uh, uh, 10, 15, but at 11 o'clock, we have a survivor panel, uh, including uh, one of the thrivers, the Honorable Judge Robert Long, and then a prayer service in our beautiful chapel of St. Anthony. So I hope you will join us. Now, a little bit of administrative uh, issues, because I know our participants are also expecting to get uh, their certificates for CMEs and CEUs and also certificate of participation. So, but before I do that, I really want to thank one more time uh, University of Miami, uh, U Health, Thrive Clinic, and also the University of Miami Division of CMEs and Audio Digest Foundation. And let me, I always like to give also credit to the people because it's not, institution is a big name, but who's doing that? 
And I want to recognize here Oscar Reyes and Diana Love Welsh for their extraordinary work back at the UM, my team at St. Thomas Law School Human Trafficking Academy, uh, Ms. Liza Smoka and Carla Garcia. They did a fabulous job, and thanks to them, we all we are able to uh, be here uh, uh, today in this microcosm of who's who in the work in the intersection of trafficking, law, and healthcare. So for uh, CME, so University of Miami Leonard Miller School of Medicine designates this live activity for a maximum of 1.5 AMA PRA category one credits. The University of Miami School of Nursing and Health Studies designates this seminar series for a maximum of 1.5 CEU credits for Florida licensed nurses only. To claim the CMEs, the CEUs, and the certificate of attendance, tomorrow you will be receiving an email from us asking for a survey. We are using the same email that you, register, that you use to register for this event. Complete that evaluation is important. Without that evaluation, you are not getting the credits. <laughs> so uh, complete the evaluation and uh, then we will be able to have you get the CMEs and the CUs. The CME certificates need five to seven business days to be ready. The CEU certificates will uh, require, for nurses only this one, one to two weeks. And for the certificate of attendance for everybody, five to seven days. More information and the brochure is all online. And of course, at all times, feel free to contact us at human trafficking at stu.edu. And that's it for tonight. Thank you so very much. God bless you all for the extraordinary work you do. And Lech Valesa used to say, go out now and save the world. We can end human trafficking in our lifetime. God bless you. Have a good night.